I consider myself, I'm an information designer, but I actually studied architectural history, so they've always been my kind of friends and enemies at the same time, architects with their amazing um, idea that they can redesign the world that we live in, which I've always found quite arrogant. Um, which is the point? Which, which one? Oh, this one. Um, I consider myself, I, I, I design things that people read. I design maps and I design like The Economist here, the magazine. And I think cities are also things that we read. I mean, the, the project we did in London uh, started six, seven years ago. It's called Legible London, uh, which started, actually started in, in Bristol uh, 15 years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, how do we read our cities? Uh, reading them meaning we acquire the knowledge that's inside the system, just like I read a, a magazine and I acquire at least some of the knowledge that, that is in there. And to an extent, uh, some of that means we are, you know, getting back uh, we've given our, our cities over to cars or trains or whatever, uh, architects uh, who think they can design us. Architects think they design cities by designing buildings, but well, we live in the space between buildings. And I'm very grateful, having heard this morning, uh, the distinction between vertical and horizontal, because we are horizontal. I mean, Spider-Man is the only person I know who climbs buildings. We walked along the streets, and uh, for me, cities are, as in New York, are very much horizontal. And we, we try to encourage people to use them again. And it's always nice to see that there is a German word, it's called a Trampelfahrt, which is the little trample path that people will make. Architects design these great corners, four weeks later somebody would have made a diagonal crossing and the other people will follow. So we have a great sort of, you know, German imperial building, nobody's going to go wa walk around the bloody corner. They're going to make their little Trampelfahrt through the middle of it because that's how we work. And we're the only people. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we build, you know, well, this is, you know, this one sheep there goes, makes that little curve. Why? And why do the others follow? They want to trample in the snow, whatever. So we have a tendency to follow each other, which is good and bad, uh, coming from a German. Um, <laughs> but let's not forget that this sort of Trampelfahrt was actually built by people. This was designed. I mean, somebody thought that we want to sit in a car for an hour and drive from Santa Monica to Pasadena or from downtown to, New to West Hollywood. I mean, isn't that an incredibly dumb idea to put people in these boxes, pollute the air and spend hours in a car? I mean, who thunk of that for Christ's sake? Uh, planners, designers, architects, engineers, I'm afraid to say. Um, so how do we get out of that rut? Uh, our European cities and, and the East Coast cities in America, however, were pretty much designed around the railway. This is Berlin, the Gleisdreieck, the, the, the railway triangle, built around the, the, the turn of the previous century, the 1890s, snapped back in the middle of Berlin. Now, these have, are still being used, but uh, the space that they occupy has pretty much fallen into disrepair. The, the one on the, on, on the right is actually present Berlin. So right in the middle of Berlin, which you know is right by the former border, we have this incredible space which uh, had lied dormant for 60 years. You know, trees had gone through walls, trees had grown through old railway cars that were on the side. There was vegetation there that didn't exist anywhere else in Europe because uh, the, the railway cars had brought seeds in from all, all, all over Europe. So suddenly we, we, we get in this space back to ourselves, we're building parks there, luckily, not car parks. In America, you probably say, oh my God, we can park a thousand cars there, how cool is that? No, we actually make it accessible for people which I think is a lot more useful. And the amazing success of the High Line in New York, which is a, a poncy little, what is it, a one mile, it's a half hour walk, which is a, you know, it's, 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 it's a little joke if you, if you look at Hyde Park or Central Park or whatever. But my God, the world is all about, they're make, making High Lines now in every other American city and village because people, you know, what they, it's like going to, to, the, to the workout studios in America. I, I, I used to live next to one in San Francisco. So people would drive from their work after work uh, have a valet park their car, then they go upstairs and go on one of those treadmills, uh, watch Bloomberg for tw half, half an hour and, and work on a treadmill instead of walking there from their bloody offices and walking back home. Uh, I can never understand that why I have to spend half an hour walking when it's what I do every day anyway. So the high line is people get out the cars and then walk and then go back to their cars. I, I don't get it. I do get it. I, I, I'm, I'm glad it's happening, but it's a kind of a weird concept for a European. But once we're, we're in the middle of, of a city, which is essentially the, the cities that we like are messy because they've grown over decades and centuries. And uh, you know, if you look at the successful squares in the world, none of them is straight. If you go to the Italian cities, even to Siena, they're all at angles and they're all actually quite deceptive. Have you ever walked across the, the big square in Siena? It takes forever. It's massive. 
But you look at it, you think it's small because it's all foreshortened. It's very, very, nothing is central. The, the well is off center. None of the Italian squares are central. Only the fascists build central squares. If you go to East Berlin, you see the vision of some poncy little uh, semi or quasi dictator. He thought the world looks big, so we have to make eight lanes. They had about two cars in East Berlin, but I made eight lanes for them. You see the same in Bucharest and places. They had roads long before they had cars. <laughs> Little bit the different. But anyway, so how do, we, how, do we, how do we find our way around? I mean, signs? Would you trust that stuff? And you see this everywhere. I know this is Ireland, is the other extreme. Uh, and now, now they should probably be in a museum, because you couldn't design this if you tried. Uh, but I mean, then you stop there, and you're trying to find your way. You know, you have angry people probably shooting you. Well, that would be in Texas, but uh, um, if you hesitate, but there you have to hesitate because you have no idea what they're telling you. Because um, the one thing about, about uh, signs is <laughs> we, and of course all of us designers have thousands of these slides. I have uh, hard drives full of accidental um, stuff that people design because everybody's a de designer and that's asking for it. You know, putting moustaches on people and on, on the posters in the tube and stuff, or you know, blacking our teeth is what we all do because it's our way of appropriating the system. Because we don't know who makes these signs, so we don't trust them. And that's actually not a bad thing. Uh, let me take you to this little example in Stockholm. Um, now, every psychologist would probably know that affirming is better than, than forbidding. So this, we have one, at least one Dane who can read this. Um, it's, it's a, it's a no-stopping sign, right? And, but it doesn't apply to loading and offloading. Uh, between 5 and 11, no between 5 and 11, and certainly not between 5 and 11. Um, no, I call that very redundant. And, and of course, by the time I've read this, I've got a parking ticket. Uh, it is, what it, I think uh, one of them is weekdays, the other one is weekends, the other one is probably Sundays. If, you, if you're a Swede and you live there, you know this, but I mean, come on, doesn't anybody think about this? Five, you know, don't fucking park there between 5 and 11. I mean, that's <laughs> basically what it says, unless you're offloading. Um, so no wonder that people don't take those signs seriously. And then in Berlin, we have a, 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 a so-called pedestrian signage system. And uh, just look at the one on the right, Reichstag Bundestag, 1,350 meters. Now, that's a really nice sum that as a tourist from Spain or China, I, oh, that's going to take me uh, 32 and a half minutes to walk properly. I mean, that is rubbish. Apart from the fact that it's, it's a Microsoft system font, Arial, which we all love to hate, uh, it has arrows all in the wrong place. You never put arrow before a word. You put it in the direction you're walking. In this case, the right arrow has to go on the right-hand side. I mean, that's common knowledge for signing system. Not known by most designers, but it's still common knowledge. It should be. Uh, so this, this, of course, nobody takes seriously because you don't know where it comes from. Who made this? Some bureaucrat in some office uh, who goes home at 4.30, obviously. Uh, so do we read maps? Now, the, uh, you all know this if, you, if you've uh, traveled to London. The London tube is actually a diagram. It's not a map. It is a, an, uh, it is a, a symbolic representation of the city. It, does, it bears very little relationship to the, 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 the ground above. It has some, but not exactly. Uh, obviously, the, you know, from Green Park to Piccadilly Circus, you can walk. Uh, you, know, you can't do that once you go to the, to the outskirts. But people use this because it's free, it's available, it's easy to understand. When we did the legible London thing six, seven years ago, we looked at this, and if you look at some of those, most of the stations in London, at least in central London, you can walk to the next one. You're at Leicester Square, you can walk to Covent Garden in three minutes. You're at Bank, you can walk to Monument in one minute. If you spend more time underground than you spend overground walking. So the, um, you look at all these, and all these tube stations, there's a, a two or three dozen tube stations in London that are within five minutes walk of each other. Now, interestingly, London, different from other places, um, Transport for London at the time was interested in getting people off the tube. Most places would love people to use transport, public transport. In London, the tube is overloaded. Uh, there's too many people using the tube, and a lot of people are tourists who will use them between one of those stops where they could easily walk, walking not only because they will take load off the system, but also because they, they expose themselves to the city. It's much more fun to walk uh, even from Leicester Square to Covent Garden than to take the tube and you know, be in those tunnels forever. So that was the first uh, revelation. And then, of course, we all know, and, and research again showed it, that people don't understand maps. Most, you see them at the corners. People don't know where north. I mean, nobody knows where north is. Uh, where is north? You know, west is where the moss grows on trees. But I mean, who, you know, where do you do check that in London? Um, uh, which also is something funny. I, I find that 
only the Anglo-Saxon uh, countries ever use uh, the, the directions. If you go to Italy or France or Germany, the axis will never be called north or west or something. We just call them after a place. But in, I think it's that grist system that comes out of New York, you know, in Manhattan you know where north is, it's pretty obvious. Um, we, we don't use it. Anyway, people don't understand maps, they don't like maps, uh, but they understand neighborhoods. They know when the New York, they've got to go to Williamsburg, this is where it's happening. They may not know where Williamsburg is, but you know, they need to be led there. They don't care that it's part of this and part of that, they just need to go there. And people also understand that neighborhoods have meaning. You know, you go one to hang out, you go one to buy. I've only got five minutes, I've only done five minutes. Okay, well, I'm going to be very, even quicker. But so what we do with a, the with a system, we connect neighborhoods, um, which is what people understand. So this, people, if you don't like maps, you make maps they like. The, the, the map, uh, the, the right one is the first one we did in Bristol uh, in the late 90s, um, which is easy because it's an easy city. In London, you have to put in buildings, they have to be three-dimensional. Other people can't read buildings f like architects can. They need an elevation because they need to see the building is tall or low or whatever. It's obvious. And you put them in the middle and you put a circle around and it says 15 minutes. If you've got 15 minutes time to walk or you've got legs for 15 minutes, go there. Very, very simple. And then you put them where they need it. If you go outside now, now even they're all over London. The first ones were on Bond Street and in the West End. Now they're all over the place. Um, they are pretty useful. They are, will have electronics in them. They will talk to your smartphone eventually. But one thing that's better than maps is, is map apps, of course, because you can carry them with you. You may have the correspondent hardware in the street. You can download, um, you know, whether it's Harry Beck's or, or, or my map. And beyond that, of course, in, within the same app, you have, in this case, Deutsche Bahn telling you where you catch your train. And they have a walk in there, 200 meters in six minutes. I walk 200 meters in three minutes, but this is for maybe for people who've got luggage. So you buy into a system that tells you how to get there, how to use it. Uh, and of course, what the train guys have understood there aren't just trains, there are also cars and there are also bicycles. I won't go into the Boris bikes, which I think is a very big misnomer. He certainly inherited them and didn't invent them. But um, the big guys understand, and so do the car companies, that traffic is something that is um, connected. You can't just have one mode of transport. Well, what did London do because it collapsed? You know, they charged people, which is one way of keeping people out of cities, making it impossible to, or to afford, which of course is unjust. If you go to uh, Porsche Cayenne, you don't care, you can pay eight, eight, uh, eight pounds an hour, you don't care. Um, but who says we have uh, to own a car in order to use it? You know, this, you heard about this the other day. Uh, it's very, very much happening that I, I work for some car companies still, and they're very worried that everybody between 18 and 35 doesn't want to own a car anymore. It's not prestige anymore. And in fact, you're embarrassed if you had a, a, a posh car in Berlin. You get it scratched anyway if you park in some areas. But what's important about uh, the car hire stuff, the same goes for bikes, it's, it is, they have to be everywhere. If you only have one, you have to search them, stick them out, it won't work. Um, so we, we did a project, uh, and just quickly to show how, how we do this, this is user-centered design, service design, whatever. You look at how people would use it, and these days with the media we have, you can fake this. So we made a little prototype, a key that actually works, um, that you made an app that isn't actually an app, it's, on a, it's a fake PDF on, on a phone, but you get a, a few dozen people to walk along and find their car. You can see this is just, just a little cardboard thing. Go inside the car, the, you can get a, a near frequency communication device, you can, you can hack that within in 10 minutes. So you, you sit people in the car, you use an iPad instead of the, the, the on-car system just to find out how did they use this. And we spent uh, three months with a few hundred people uh, and then they build the system afterwards. So it's built by the people who use it, not by some designer at, an, at some desk or other. Now, one, one issue that concerns me, where's all this power gonna come from? You know, we're all gonna be electric. Where's they gonna come from? Um, that's one idea. We are, we're renovating those and uh, some guy in Austria went along, said, hey, we have all of those. I don't know if they still have them in America, there's certain lots here, we certainly have them in Germany. Telephone booths, let's make them into charge stations. They're wired up, they've got power there and they're by the curb, often on street corners. Perfect place for charging uh, cars. Now, you see the way lib in, in Paris, it doesn't mean they're free, but it means they liberate people. That's how I understood the word. Because cycling is actually quite an amazing activity. It's healthy, it's good for you. Uh, if you make it easy, if they're everywhere and they're easy to get, you have a winner. Yes, I am, I'm done, three more slides. Um, this is of course Copenhagen, the, the mecca for, for bicycles. Uh, I could show you one in winter, they, they also use the bikes, but you have to have an infrastructure. You really can't just say bikes go, you have to do like New York, you know, take some parking space away, and then people will use them. There's a few problems that need to be addressed, um, like parking cars, 
is an issue. This is Amsterdam. You know, I have a bike park there. I'm never going to find it again unless I painted neo, neo pink or something. Uh, I know it's in there somewhere, but I'd be damned if I find it again. So that's an issue we have to address. Um, one issue has been, that's in America, of course, you have to have a cup holder. Um, so that has been dealt with. You can buy a cup holder for your, for your bicycle. So no more problems. And this is my full disclosure. Uh, I am a bicycle freak, so I, I am not totally unbiased about this whole issue. Um, and now car companies are, are making electric bikes, you know, Audi and, uh, and Smart, and you can actually $3,500, euros, pounds, whatever, so it's not cheap. But they know that they have to be sexy and trendy, and they jumped on the bandwagon. And if the car companies don't jump on the bandwagon, you have to start taking it seriously. Uh, so, the, it's very simple, whatever you, you provide, you make it ubiquitous, make it everywhere, in other words, make it easy, maybe even fun, I heard that word mentioned a couple of times before, and uh, then you have a winner. You also should get some of us involved, because we can make things easy to use and legible. Thank you. And I, and I have to say, I'm also, uh, I'm also so sorry that Herr Speer did not come here after your speech. I, it would have been very interesting to have heard a very different view of uh, urban planning. But, um, <laughs> um, yes, I know. Okay. yeah. Uh, so so I, uh, I have to defend uh, the High Line in New York a little bit because, of course. <laughs> no, it's fine. I love it. I just I think it's, it's a little over, you know. You guys think it's amazing. Also, New Yorkers, <laughs> New Yorkers don't drive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I get a question in quick. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I suppose I will. I mean, I, I take your basic point that that that, that good design uh, makes cities function better, and that we don't listen to designers; we listen to architects too much. Um, but I, I, is, is, does that Bad actually? Architects. <laughs> yeah, but does that actually make any sense? I mean, um, it sounds to me like what you're suggesting is not actually any different from what Alejandro was talking about. That no. is to say, a, 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 a listening to people, how they want to use cities, and, and responding yeah. to them is what makes yeah. good maps, good diagrams, and everything else, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just making it, bringing it down to earth again. That's all. Yeah. Horizontal. I, I was trying to say something slightly different. Yeah. Good. Which is that architects can detect and formalize certain latent. Uh, tendencies that make these processes explicit. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not just about listening to people, right. it's about being able to listen to people and to, and, and to be able to explain through architecture that, uh, that action of listening. Or Which or is what we do by design. Yeah, we exactly. listen to people and make things accessible by using our tools. But also to, expli to, ex yeah. to explicitate. To explicitate the processes that are happening behind our designs. Michael. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that that's a, that's that's basically what you're suggesting happens when you pool information, let's say, about smart cars and so forth. I mean, uh, the, the the question, I guess, would be: so what is so what is the m what is the moral role of the designer then? I mean, you 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 slip very easily from talking about. Uh, the need for bike lanes and the, and the use of cities to s suddenly talking about 3,500 pound, uh, you know, electric bikes that are uh, Mercedes' way of, of trying to capitalize on, on a bike culture, but it's an extremely different notion of uh, what the value of biking is. You say you're a bicyclist, it's not healthy. It's a, it seems to me that um, if you equally facilitate the creation of a 3,500 pound bike and, and, uh, and, and also good signage for bicyclists, there I'm not saying you, you, you can't do it, but surely those are different sorts of enterprises, no? Not really. Well, our role is we're, we're translators. We, we get a, a, an issue, a, a problem to solve, whether it's housing in your case or whether it's, it's, it's uh, moving about horizontally in my case. Uh, if a car company comes to me and says, you know, design me the process to, to, to uh, rent our cars for five minutes, or uh, um, a cycle company comes and says, you know, how can we make this accessible to people? We design the interface, the software, the hardware, to make people use them, to so make them legible. Uh, for me, the word legible is the most important. I think we need to move on. And from interfaces, let's go back to architecture and cities we'll and spaces with Bjarke Engel. If you could welcome Bjarke.